Ladies and gentlemen, I know some people are still in the traffic, but they will join us a bit later on. My name is Uraj Shaggy, a faculty in the Morg Family Department of Chemical and Geometric Science, and on behalf of the faculty, students, and staff, I'd like to welcome you to the 2011 union, reunion of the graduates and, and many of our supporters. So welcome. To uh, give you a little overview of uh, the department, there's a quick movie produced by Julie, and we're going to show that movie to you. <coughs> Giannis Yorsis couldn't be here because he's one of our own faculty and he sent the message welcoming the alumni. and 
the Department of Chemical Engineering in particular. If you witness your long and steadfast, steadfast commitment to the department and the composites area, your generosity in establishing an endowment of advanced research in this fascinating area, an area that helps us develop new, lightweight, strong materials that can be used in many applications, uh, in composites, in aircraft, uh, other type of devices, uh, which will help make things more energy efficient, more streamlined, and tougher. I'm sure that I share with my colleagues, Steve Nutt, and his students and collaborators of our gratitude to you for this wonderful uh, gift that you have give, given us over the years. Uh, as a former department chairman of chemical engineering, and as a chemical engineer myself, I have a strong affinity to the work that you have done and to the legacy that you are living. And the last, uh, the least thing that we can do for you is to honor you with this uh, award. We certainly personify the vision and the uh, attributes of UAC Chemical Engineering alumni, and we believe that this award is a small token of our appreciation for the role that you have played uh, promoting the school, the department, and the specific field on composites uh, for many, many years to come. Thank you, and again, my regrets for not being there to congratulate you myself in person. Thanks so much. As many of you know, in 2005, one of our graduates, John Mort, endowed the department with a, with a generous gift. And as a result of that, three programs, petroleum, chemical, and material science, merged into one department. John Mort was uh, the recipient of the Distinguished Alumni Award two years ago. Again, he apologized he couldn't be here, but he has also sent a note welcoming you to this event. Good evening, and welcome to the Alumni Award dinner of the Mort Family Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Sciences. The department, like all at USC, has grown in quality and stature over the decades. I, like many alums, question whether I could even get into USC or with the quality of today's students. But in the case of our honoree tonight, this would not be a question. Merwin Gill is an entrepreneur, a business titan, and most important, a Trojan engineer. He is the founder of a world-renowned manufacturing company and has grown that company to be the largest and best in the world. He honors USC with his service as a Viterbi Board of Council member and a member of the USC Board of Trustees and has endowed the Mervyn C. Gale Foundation Composite Center at USC. I am pleased to call Merwin a friend and we are honored that Merwin is a lifelong member of the Trojan family. Please salute a great Trojan with me and enjoy this wonderful evening. Fight on. Thank you, John. We have uh, Dave Kilpatrick, who's a member of the Departmental Advisory Group uh, attending tonight. He's a USC graduate, and he's also going to welcome you on behalf of the Advisory Board. Thank you, Raj. Of course, I wasn't going to be here this evening. I was going to send a video of myself. But <laughs> yeah. At the last minute, I, I canceled a trip to Houston, and I'm here. And uh, of course, Raj said, please speak for a few minutes for the Advisory Board, so I will. Yeah, we had a recent meeting advisory board, and, and at those meetings, we get a chance to get a snapshot of the, the Moore family department. And we get a look at the professors we have, the curriculum we have, but it's led off by Dean Yortzos talking about the incoming freshmen and, and statistics on the whole Viterbi school. And I have to tell you, you know, John referred to it in his video, the incoming students today are outstanding. And the caliber of this school, the Viterbi school, is outstanding. And, the, and what amazes me on the advisory, being on the advisory board, is what's going on in the Mork family department from the standpoint of innovation. It, it's, it's incredible. We get a chance to see new faculty, existing faculty, what they're doing, and, and how the programs are changing. I kind of agree with John Mork. 
when I look at what's going on, I don't think I would have been accepted to USC. <laughs> I am the on, on the advisory committee. I think I'm the token bachelor's degree person. Right. Everybody else has a PhD. They can understand more of the uh, when we get into the very technical stuff. I'm sort of looking at the basic. Uh, hey, I want to see that we can get kids out there bachelor's degrees get out and work. I know the university has, and, and the department has a real goal to, for, for kids to go on for their masters and PhDs, but I think there's a real value for somebody getting out with a technical degree, as a, you know, with a bachelor's degree, and getting out in the real world. And what I see in the department is very positive. We look at curriculum, we look at the professors, we look at the physical plant, you know, what we have here, and I have to tell you, it, it is in great condition. So from somebody with less of a technical approach to it, more of a people approach to it, I think this department's in great shape. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Because so Dave didn't tell you that he's the one who runs the whole oil business in California. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Theo Chatsis, who's the chair of the department since uh, the department name was changed to more family department, and he's tolerated all of his faculty. <laughs> <laughs> They are fortunate to work with all these faculty. It's a, a great group of folks. And I'm really pleased to see all the, you folks showing up here tonight. I know some of you have come from faraway places. And we really appreciate it that you're here. And my goal really is to, besides thanking you and thanking you for Mr. Gill for coming here and being here for us, and being here to be recognized by all of us, is to introduce the true heroes of the event. Dennis Lula and Frank Kerr, who are here the two organizers, and of course Clarence Forster. And uh, Clarence Forster is another distinguished graduate of ours, uh, head of the transplant dating division at UCI. He's a fellow who worked for me when he was a chemical engineer undergraduate student, and he's in Iraq right now, serving our country. So he's here. But Dennis and Frank are here, so I would like to have him recognized. They're here in our alumni division, and they're doing a fantastic job. Well, uh, Frank and I, and also on behalf of Clarence, who can't be here because he's serving our country in Iraq right now, uh, a little background there, he's a very uh, distinguished medical doctor, moved from chemical engineering to medicine. Uh, he also considers himself a professor because where he is, he considers himself a teaching hospital. Anyway, we, uh, we welcome you all of you here, it's, uh, and we also thank the uh, staff who helped put this together without their assistance. This wouldn't happen, but this is uh, really a wonderful event. It's the third time we've done this. Uh, we hope to expand it. Uh, we've now had uh, two tailgates. Uh, we're going to do that again. And uh, I think what's helping our event is our mailing list is getting better and better and better. And so that is uh, very, very grateful. And uh, I also think what's, what's important is that, in fact, as David Kilpatrick pointed out, uh, the Morgue Family Department is, has never been healthier. Its reputation is stellar, and it is attracting uh, outstanding students and uh, outstanding faculty, as you'll hear more about later. Do you want to add anything, Frank? Yeah, I'll go ahead and add a few remarks from a hiring perspective. Uh, I, I'm one of the, uh, the, the per, uh, company representatives that go and uh, each, each year uh, come out and recruit kids. And let me tell you, our students are awesome. Uh, we, as Jacobs Engineering, hired three uh, graduates uh, recently and they are very good. Um, and again, we, we would love to have the students come out um, once they become alumni to continue to uh, grow uh, our alumni network. So welcome again, and thank you. And I think now is the uh, time for dinner. Uh. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I think we're going to go uh, table by table, if I understand it. So, why don't we have table one? This is a buffet, apparently. Uh, go up and get your meal. Okay. And then table two. Two reserve tables. the mic so I don't have to scream. Just, and I feel like acoustics in here aren't fabulous. I'll take that. There are words yep. on here. Excellent. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk for only 20 minutes and I'm going to trust that my husband um, will yeah, make a face if I go over. <laughs> So first, um, this is a picture of my research group, and I always like to give them credit because they're, they're the students, as many of you remember, who actually do the work. So they're, they're kind of the critical part of the, the team. So briefly, um, I'm gonna give a, an introduction to nanotechnology and what that means um, in today's society, and then talk briefly uh, about how cancer is diagnosed um, conventionally, and then give a very, very three slide overview about how, at least in our group, we're trying to improve these methods. So everyone in here is an engineer, but there are a couple people who aren't. Um, so how exactly uh, a nano and what it means. So we start off at the millimeter scale, and this is a picture of a retinal implant. So this little tiny uh, micro scale device can actually be implanted in your eye. And it actually, if you've had some sort of um, trauma to your eye, but your uh, retinal nerve still works, uh, you can actually improve your vision and restore your vision partially. And this, this type of device is actually being developed in the uh, Keck School of Medicine and the Doheny Eye Institute at USC. So if you take this down by a factor of, uh, of three, or 10 to the three, uh, you actually end up at the micro scale. And this is an example of a, of a micro gear. And similar um, in the biological domain, uh, you have hair and bacteria. So microns are very small. If you take it down again by a factor of a thousand, um, you end up in the nanoscale. So things like carbon nanotubes, um, viruses, and DNA. Um, carbon nanotubes are actually a very interesting material. Uh, they, they started off, um, were originally used, but not officially discovered by Toyota, and they were put, as I'm sure Steve knows, um, they were used in tires, and they discovered that they, they make tires a lot stronger. And it wasn't um, until you know, the 80s that people actually figured out what a carbon nanotube was and why it worked and why it, it was so strong. Um, but it was used for 30 years before people actually figured out what this material was. So there, there are many impact areas of, of nanotechnology. Um, they range from energy, the conventional technology, things like uh, the screen of your, your iPhone, um, consumer products, so um, like sunblock. So, so there are little tiny nanoparticles in our sunblock, which is why sunblock today is so much more efficient than it was you know, 15 years ago, and why you don't have to apply it you know, every hour, why you can leave it on for six hours, and why it's waterproof. Um, and then also biotechnology. And these are just a couple pictures. So this is an example of a solar cell made using nanotechnology, and it's bendable and flexible, which is distinctly different than what people usually think of solar cells, like the big crystalline structures that you can't bend or wrap around trees. Um, and this is an example of you know, what I like to call the conventional nanotechnology. It's a little tiny fly, which is a robotic, and it actually can fit on your finger. Um, and this is something that uh, I show to my freshman class, and then a lot of them go out and buy it. So it's, it's a light that can fit in your shower head, and it has a little tiny temperature sensor in there. And when the water is cold, it's blue, and when the water becomes warm, it turns red. <laughs> so it, it, it can tell you if your water is hot or cold. Um, and then this is a picture of three living cells, and it, it's actually labeled, the, the cells are labeled with these little tiny particles which light up in different colors. And depending on where they are in the cell, they'll, they'll shine different colors. So you can actually see the structure of a cell as the cell is alive and moving around. And so you can find out very important information about how cells behave in different environments. So there are, even within just the realm of biotechnology, there are many different impact areas. Um, so 
One, one example which, which I really find interesting um, is in the uh, realm of implantable devices. So this is an example of a neural implant, which in this particular device is actually being used in humans now, um, which they can actually implant in the brain. And if you have a part of your brain which is damaged, but one part works well and the other part works well, but there's just a little tiny part that would be like a damaged bridge. This can actually go in there and Re replace that bridge so, so you can regain use of that previously unaccessible region of your brain. And this is having tremendous impact in patients who have Parkinson's. So it's able to restore some of that, that lost behavior. Um, and then finally, uh, the last one that we're going to focus on today is diagnostics. Um, one of the currently um, improvements in diagnostics is in a, a strep throat, a strep throat test. Um, when I was a child, and I'm pretty sure when everybody in here was a child, um, you used to have to get a strep throat culture. So you would go, they would scrape your throat, you would grow cells, you'd find out 48 to 72 hours later if you actually had strep throat. Now if you have children, you know that they go, they swab your throat and you find out in 15 minutes. Um, the reason why it's so much faster is because they've improved how they actually do the test. And they do a completely different way. They don't do cultures anymore. They look for markers. They look for specific proteins instead of actually looking at the cell itself. So it's just making completely new diagnostic methods, not doing incremental improvement. So how is cancer diagnosed? This is the, the big picture. So you basically, you think you, you might have cancer, right? Maybe you have a symptom, or maybe you go to the doctor and you get a physical. So then they're like, okay, we, we found something. So, so then they're gonna do a biopsy, which means they actually go in, surgically remove a piece of tissue. And then the doctor examines it, and the doctor either determines that that tissue is benign or it's malignant. But in order to do this, you have to have something to biopsy, which is a problem, because you want to detect cancer before there's something to biopsy. You want to detect it way before that so that you can stop cancer from even occurring, so you can do pre-tumor detection. So in order to figure that out, you need to figure out exactly what markers are an indicator that you might eventually develop a tumor and you might eventually have that tumor progress to being cancerous. So this is a picture of how tumors form. So you start off with just a mass of cells. So all the blue ones are just happy, hanging out. Um, the red line here is a vein. And the yellow ones are cancer cells. But cancer cells, they aren't near the vein, so they're just hanging out, not doing anything. All of you right now, not to scare you, all of you have cancer cells in you right now that, that are kind of like this, just hanging out, not doing anything. Nothing, they're, they're never gonna do anything. They're just gonna hang out there. Okay. No one's gonna sleep now. <laughs> I, I know, no one's gonna sleep because of this cartoon. Okay. Um, so then, suddenly, for, suddenly everyone gets noisy. Um, so then suddenly a triggering event happens. And the vein goes from looking like this, all nice and normal, to suddenly detaching and the vein begins to dilate and get bigger. When the vein dilates and gets bigger, suddenly the cancer cells begin to get closer to the vein and then at some point, it's called angiogenic sprouting, which basically means that the vein actually begins to interact directly with the cancer cells. At this point, you're in trouble. That, that's it. Um, because at this point, the cancer cells begin to get blood, they get energy, they get nutrients, and then from this point, you end up with more cancer cells more blood spreading, and then you end up with, with your entire tumor mass. So the question is, how do we detect this event? How do we detect when your vessels begin to dilate before they've actually interacted with the cancer cells? And what markers are there for this, this phase? So there are a lot of researchers trying to figure out exactly what those markers are, right? Because clearly there has to be some trigger to cause your vein to change its shape. And, and there are, and they've discovered them. Um, and and th there, there's this whole series with lots of things that end in Aiden uh, on this side, which keeps it from happening. And then on this side, there, there's a whole series of things that actually cause it to happen. So, so there are lots of things that we could try to detect and monitor. But the question is, how can we detect all of them at the same time? Right? You don't want to just detect one. Because if you detect one, then maybe you ate a lot of spinach that day and so for some reason spinach is causing you to have a very high level of one of these markers. So you want to detect 15 or 20 or 50 at the same time so that as we as engineers know, you can correlate your signals and make sure that everything is lining up and that you do in fact know that there's something you need to address. 
So how they do it now, since they, they don't have these fabulous methods, is they either image or they do something called protein screening. So imaging is good because you can determine exactly where, whatever your tumor is, where it is in your body. You can determine if it's active or not, so if it's actually growing. Um, however, it has poor resolution because you need many cancer cells. Um, and also, it's not sensitive to chemical marker. So you couldn't do this kind of protein screening for 50 proteins because you actually are imaging cells, not individual proteins. Similarly, with a biomarker of protein screening, this can distinguish different types of cancers because it can look for different, different proteins. Um, it's very sensitive for like a single cell, but it's not able to detect very low numbers of proteins. So it's not going to be able to detect at this stage, the, the key stage. Um, it requires an accurate biomarker, so we need to know what we want to detect. That, that's always important. It also requires a lot of sample. So I like my blood, I don't know about you, but I, I want to keep my blood in my body. So this is when this becomes a problem, right? If you only want to detect one protein, it's fine. If you want to detect a thousand, this is a problem. So how protein screening works, is you basically start off with something that looks like this, where each one of these little squares can detect a different, a different protein. You drop your sample on top. You then rinse it off so that all the excess stuff goes away. And then wherever you had one of your proteins, it attached, and then you end up with a signal. So here you have a yellow signal, here you have a red signal, a green signal, and a pink signal. And because you have a signal, you know that whatever it was you were looking for was present which is good. However, the test is only as accurate as whatever this targeting molecule is, and it's also limited by these color molecules. So you can only have a certain number of colored molecules. There's only a certain number of colors in the rainbow. So in order to really improve this, we we'll obviously want to be able to screen for more colors than there are in the rainbow, so thousands to tens of thousands. We want it to be highly reliable. You want to know what you have, and you also want to make sure you aren't being told you have something you don't. Uh, we also want it to be very sensitive, so the, the NIH and the Department of Defense have set the standard of one drop of blood, um, preferably one to two drops, but ideally one. So they came up with the standard based on if you can do it with one drop of blood, then you can do a fingerprint test. If you can do a fingerprint test, then you don't need a syringe. So if you don't need a syringe, then you don't have any biohazard waste. That suddenly takes care of biohazard waste. You don't need those big red containers putting dirty needles in. So then if you, if you can do it with a finger prick, then that means you could transfer something like cancer screening to Walgreens or CVS. So it, it, take, it cheapens the entire process. So the, the one drop of blood is the, the dream goal. Right now, they would be happy with a milliliter. But one drop, you know, if I'm making a dream method list, one drop is where, is where we're heading. So, in order to do this, that, that's where nanomethods come in, because nanomethods are small, so you could get a thousand sensors under one drop. So there are kind of four primary methods. Um, there's electrical. So how electrical works is whenever something binds to your surface, you see a change in conductivity, so a change in current, um, a change in resistance, something along those lines. Uh, there's mechanical, so whenever you have a protein bind, this little thing which looks like a nano diving board bends, and you can see that deflection. So you can tell that things are binding because it bends. There's magnetic, so these are little tiny magnetic beads that whenever things attach to them, they change their position, and you can detect them, their changing height. And then optical, there are many types, but I put my device here because it's mine. Um, so I'm going to talk about this more. Hey, I get to advertise. It's, it's marketing. Um, so, overview of research. So, so this is my research and how I'm trying to solve this problem. So basically in our lab, what we do is we develop new types of optical devices. So an optical device is anything that confines light or emits light or in any way manipulates light. So we develop new types of optical devices that do all of those things and then we develop them specifically to try to detect and study and understand biological systems. So both understand how cells talk to each other, understand how antibodies and antigens react with each other, understand um, and improve ways to detect you know, hundreds of thousands of proteins inside a complex, mix complex mixture like blood. 
So we, we develop them for specific applications. We don't just come up with something cool and then say, well, let's find an application for it. So we, we specifically develop things for specific applications. So right now we're working on two. Um, one is a waveguide and one's a resonant cavity, and I'll explain what those are. And then after that we come up with really good ways of attaching those targeting molecules to the surface of those cavities so that we don't have you know, high false positive and false negative weight rates. So that we know whenever something binds, we know what it is that binds. And then we use them in a couple different applications. Um, so right now we're focusing on water monitoring, um, on studying how proteins bind and, and unbind from each other, and also on a process called DNA methylation, which I can tell you about offline. So here we go. Um, so th these are the two main devices that we use. Um, one of them is this little mushroom structure. So this structure is about 100 microns in diameter, which again is about the width of your hair. Uh, we make them in the clean room at USC, so it's in my building. And, and I have grad students and undergrads making these. It isn't as though I, I ship them off and you know, have Intel make them for me. Um, so this is actually one that an undergrad made for me. Uh, so they're, they're very, very good at confining light. So basically light circles around inside the device. Um, depending on how good a device it is, the light can circle around 100,000 times. So many, many, many times. And whenever something binds to the surface of the device, basically the color of light that's confined changes. And so you detect when something is bound by just monitoring the color. So it's pretty simple. And then the second device that we're working on right now is something called a waveguide. So a waveguide's kind of like a, a photonic wire. So it confines photons just like a normal wire confines electrons. So we use this device to try to create integrated photonic circuits, which are the analog of integrated electronic circuits. So this device right now is in its infancy. You can think of it as being you know, the integrated electronic circuits many decades ago. So, so right, right now we have photonic wires, and, and that's it. But, but we're working on integrating them with other things to make photonic capacitors. Things along those lines. So that's it. Um, yes, you stayed on time. Um, th these are my, my postdocs and grad students, and these are my wonderful undergrads, um, and these are all the nice people that, that pay me. <laughs> I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah. So this optical tuning, uh, if you drop a little blood, find out if there are cancerous cells in the blood, which is proteins. Yeah. That, that, that's the big picture. Right now we're working with serum, which is by without body powders. It's the microphone. Oh, oh. 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 okay. Um, so the question is the uh, with the resonators or with any sensors, um, I can't remember the exact question. Um, is, is the goal to take a drop of blood and then find out if there's cancer in it or not, cancer cells in it or not? And the goal is to find out if there are the cancer markers, if there are the proteins, um, and, and look for different relative protein concentrations because you don't want to look for a single cell. Because if you look for a single cell, there, there can always be a cell wandering around in your blood. Um, but if you look for relative protein concentrations, that, that will give you a more accurate picture about what's going on in your body. One last question. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how does it show that there's a cancer, that light goes on in that thing? Or? In, in ours, um, it, it, it changes the color or the wavelength that's being confined. So there's a shock that you see yes. this color? Yes, uh, yeah. If it changes by this much, right? If it goes from <coughs> let's say, red to burgundy as opposed to red to slightly more red. If it changes a lot, then you know that there's a lot of that protein in there. Well, so, can I, can I, yeah. so, so what kind of equipment uh, measures these wavelengths? Um, so, so right. Expensive Yeah, ex expensive equipment. Um, <laughs> keep in mind right now, right, this is, we're in a university, not I'm, a company. I'm going, I'm going to your goal of Yes, yes. Um, so, so there's there's obviously two two parts, right, to, to every sensor or detector or anything. Um, so there's the part that would be considered disposable, and there's the part that would be considered continuous instrumentation that you wouldn't throw away. Um, the disposable part would be the sensor, and that part is relatively inexpensive. The part that would be permanent instrumentation is expensive. Um, 
it, it requires something called a tunable laser, which is kind of like your laser pointer, except it can change wavelengths. So a laser pointer is fixed wavelength. So a tunable laser can change wavelengths, and those are ballpark $30,000. Um, and that's the most expensive piece of equipment, really. Um, everything else are things like cameras um, and oscilloscope, which basically just monitors what frequency is coming out. So not nothing. It's the entire system is around seventy-five thousand dollars, and that's with grad student. That's with like someone like me building it with an unlimited budget. So it could probably be cheaper. But again, that's not the goal right now. Right, the goal is to develop it, show that it works, make it reliable, go from having one sensor to having many, many sensors. So, so how many more tests are you going to need to make it reliable? There are many hurdles. Um, so right now we work with open chamber systems and we want to have a sealed system because if you're dealing with human samples, you want to have a sealed system. Um, right now we use uh, syringe pumps and we want to have something that is uh, self-pumping. So, so it, it automatically draws the sample into the chip as opposed to requiring an external syringe pump. Um, Right now, a lot how we get the light into the cavities, we use a, a mechanism that is very delicate, and we want to fix that and use a mechanism actually pioneered by JPL. So we're collaborating with the group at JPL on transferring a technique that they use for satellites into our devices. It's a NAN use group. He's in the photonic optics or quantum optics group at JPL. Um, so, so there are. There are lots of different components that we have to put together and then make it work. There isn't any massive hurdle that we don't know how to solve, but there are lots of little hurdles that we have to make function. Yeah. Uh, is it possible on one of the resonant cavities to detect multiple types of proteins and distinguish which protein is being detected? Or can you only have a section of uh, you know, an XHCG protein and then, a pro and then a CA125 in another section and so on and so forth? So it would be possible to have a sensor functionalized to detect multiple proteins. The problem is you wouldn't know which protein you were detecting. You would just know that you got a signal. Uh, which, depending on what you were looking for, may not be a problem. Um, so, for example, with the water monitoring project that we're doing, the Navy just wants to know if there is bacteria present. Um, they don't necessarily care what type of bacteria. Um, they just want to know, is there you know, this particular class of bacteria present? And if there is, they're not drinking the water. So, that, that's all they care. Um, so, in that type of situation, you can functionalize many different things on the surface of the device, and if they get a positive signal, they're moving on. So it depends what, what your application is. Anything else? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you so much.